Welcome back to our series, uh, the second lesson of the divine rule of the sexes in our topical Bible study series. <clears throat> the idea of a woman's different rule can be established by many passages of scripture. Similarly, older women should behave as befits religious people. With no scandal mongering and no addiction to wine, they must be teachers of right behaviour. They should school the young women to be affectionate to their husbands and to their children, to be sober-minded, pure in their lives, to be self-controlled, chaste, good managers of the household, kind, being submissive to their husbands, so that the word of God may not be discredited. Show yourselves in all respects a model of good works, and in your teaching, show integrity and gravity. called out are the bride of Christ. The called out ones are the called out by the gospel. Jesus willingly gave his life on the cross for his family, the called out ones. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now I want you to realize the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. As in all the congregations of the saints, women are to remain quiet in the assemblies, since they have no permission to speak theirs as a subordinate part, as the Lord itself says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husband at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in the assembly. We're talking about the worship assembly. A woman should learn in quietness and full humility. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. For God was formed first. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived and became a sinner. But women will be preserved through childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with propriety. When God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife, he was calling attention to the fact that Adam had failed to exercise spiritual leadership and thereby circumverted the divine arrangement of male-female relations. And that's also a reason why the Bible talks about Adam bringing sin into the world, even though Eve was the one who first ate the fruit. Paul concluded his instruction by noting how women may be preserved from falling into the same trap of assuming unauthorized authority should be saved in childbearing. Childbearing is a figure of speech known as a synodoc in which a part stands for the whole. Thus Paul was referring to the whole of woman's responsibility, female responsibility. Women may avoid take, taking to themselves unauthorized functions by concentrating on the functions assigned to them by God. Tasks are taken with faith and love and holiness in sobriety, i.e. self-control. It also means Christian women must maintain their godly appointed ministry in life in order to continue to be saved. The plain inference is that she has to continue in the things mentioned then she must have previously started in them. This, I believe, is the crux of the whole matter. What Paul seems to be saying is, Christian women, continue in those things you have learned, and even in the extremes of pain and travail associated with childbirth, your salvation will still burn bright. It doesn't imply personal inferiority of the woman to the man. <clears throat> the nature and authority of submission does not involve personal character. It doesn't imply personal inferiority of the woman to the man. Remember, the head of Christ is God. That's, not, that's a different role. They are the same in personality. They are equal. In many ways, that woman is superior to the man. And many of the nobler qualities are going to make up character, in patience and endurance, in gentleness, in unselfishness, in ministering to the suffering, in love. The woman is often seen as superior to the man in action. In intelligence, she is definitely his equal. Nor does authority and submission touch the question of salvation. In respect to salvation, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither born nor free, neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. 
To quote this verse, an effort to overthrow the doctrine of woman's submission to man is to ignore the a context and oppose scripture with scripture. This verse is teaching that all are saved alike, namely by the grace of God, through obedient faith in Christ Jesus. Neither is a question of ability. It's often claimed for some women that they are able speakers. This is not denied, but ability is not a criteria of what is right. A man may be skillful as a gambler, but there's no reason why he should take the license to gamble. The success women have in the pulpit has deceived and turned many away from once delivered faith. One of the first women preachers was Mrs. Julian Jane Tillman, preacher of the M.E. Church. <clears throat> to say that a person has talent and should use it could mean that Moses did right when he struck the rock. He was successful in getting water, but he disobeyed God, and thereby forfeited the privilege of entering the Promised Land. The submission of a woman to the man is a matter of position. It's a difference of role rather than of person. The Prime Minister is superior to every other man in our country in position and authority, apart from Queen or King. This doesn't necessarily mean that he is superior to every other man in character and ability. The woman is in submission to the man with respect to authority and its corresponding obligation. We miss the mark entirely when we talk about woman's rights. It's not a question of equal rights, but of different duties. A woman is talked by a different place. This means that a man has a greater measure of responsibility before God in the areas of responsibilities related to leadership in the home and in the church. God challenges man to step up to the responsibilities of leadership that God has placed on his shoulders. Too often men want to let others do what he ought to be doing. 1 Corinthians 11 I, <clears throat> I imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. And I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. God, Christ, man, woman. Notice, we're not talking about inferiority or superiority. We're talking about different roles. A wife has to be in submission to her husband in the home. Wives, submit yourselves and your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. So you wives must willingly obey your husbands in everything just as the church obeys Christ. And you husbands, show the same kind of love to your wives as Christ showed to the church when he died for her. Many women, many men like to quote the first bit, the middle bit, wives must only obey their husbands and everything, but they forget about the second bit. Husbands, show kind of, the kind, same kind of love to your wives as Christ showed when he died for her. Is the average man prepared to die for his wife? Many people talk about respect, that you need to respect me because the Bible says you need to respect me. But respect, they forget respect needs to be earned. A woman will follow a man with absolutely no problem if he is worthy of being followed, if his actions speak louder than his words. The church is the bride of Christ. Jesus willingly gave his life on the cross for his family. As men and women, I suspect, when women come to know God, we know we can place our trust in Him. He's perfect, infallible, omnipotent, omniscient, omniscient, and not only that. He gives us constant reassurance that He loves us and cherishes every single one of us. As men and women, I suspect that when we come to know Jesus, we know He is perfect as God, as trustworthy as God. And then we live with women in daily humdrum life with all its pressures and challenges. We know he cherished women and treated them with love and compassion and respect, no matter who they were. I suspect that when women come to know their husbands, it's not that easy. Men are human, flesh and blood, imperfect, inconstant, no matter how well-intentioned, and are subject to the vagaries of life just as women are. And suddenly it becomes difficult, if not seemingly almost against common sense, 
to submit to some men's authority. Knowing ourselves and your, weak, your strengths and weaknesses, it's all too easy, if not easier, to identify their faults rather than place your trust in them. This next thing, quote, I think points to the problems that so many people have with the concept of wives submitting to husbands. Here's the quote. Show me a man who lays down his life for his wife, and I will show you a wife who has no problems with submission. Recently, a young wife said, to her, said that her husband said, when I shout at you, you can't shout back at me. You need to be quiet if you want to be a good wife. Sadly, far too many men have that opinion. Within marriage, submission is something you both do. Paul's message to married couples is that with authority comes responsibility. In Paul's day, days, wives had very little power and no authority. Yet Paul is now telling husbands that they need to consider the needs of their wives. That was going against the social custom. Not only that, but to treat the needs of their wives as important as the needs of their own body. Also, a husband doesn't listen to his wife. Then he only has his own perspective to rely on. By listening to his wife, he widens his perspective allowing him to make better decisions. She is a helper. Her perspective will help him. Let's not underestimate the revolutionary nature of this within the context of both ancient and contemporary culture. If the husband actually listens to her perspective and considers her needs, this has the effect of actually empowering the woman. As by feeling that her needs are being considered, she lends all her power, support and encouragement to him to find the solutions that work for them both. This actually empowers him to make better decisions. If both are operating from love, a virtuous cycle is created. He considers her, she loved and valued. She's loved and she feels loved and valued. He looks for win-win outcomes. She shows her appreciation. He feels respected. And all is good in the world. <clears throat> this equally applies to and benefits almost all loving relationships. But it challenges both or all parties to act from a place of love and mutual regard. regard. It requires trust. There was an episode of a TV program called Submissive Wives, where the main focus was a woman providing the stable home life so the husband actually enjoys coming home. The underlying principle of the program's message seemed pretty good, but it was a problem with the advice on the practical implementation of those principles. The program appeared to assume the woman didn't need to go out to work, which then allowed her time to make herself pretty, prepare his welcome home, drinks and snacks, and be ready for a quickie at any time. No wonder the husbands featured in the program looked so happy. Thankfully, I don't believe women have to be a stepford wife to create the kinds of marriages that God wants. Women need to have an open dialogue with loving husbands to agree a division of roles that works for their particular marriages. One that calls on our individual strengths, one that both husband and wife believes will be acceptable before God. What works for one couple may not work for another. Peter says, wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. So if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behaviour of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Look at the power that is implied here. Without a word won over. That is surely the power of submission. How much harder it must be to place yourself under a thought of one who has differing or unknowable guiding principles and doesn't understand the concept of love in this way. At least in Christian marriage, the believing couple should be looking at the same guidebook. They might disagree about its interpretation. I suspect this is why the warning, do not be unequally yoked, exists. Here are some more warnings. A husband who uses these submission verses to enforce his unloving will or to get his own capricious way 
is acting in error. A wife who manipulates her husband to get her own way is acting in error. A man who imposes authority without regard to conscience or God's will is in error. A woman who submits blindly to her husband's authority without regard to conscience or God's will is also in error. The example of Ananias and Sapphira shows that each individual still retains accountability for their lives. Both decided to lie. Both were judged separately. Both will be accountable before God. But the husband will be held to a higher standard because he has the ultimate authority. Not only that, but the family friend or the onlooker who witnesses the neglect or abuse of authority but does nothing is more like a Pharisee who passes by than like a good Samaritan and will also be accountable before God. These authority and submission verses can be used as an excuse to justify inappropriate, irresponsible, dangerous or unloving behaviour. Submission doesn't mean that a woman has to be a doormat. In scripture we even have examples of women apparently flouting the husband's authority, most notably Abigail, secretly does what her husband has failed to do in order to prevent the slaughter of her household by David. Esther breaks a palace rule, risks death in order to protect her family and all the Jews from death at the hands of Haman. These examples show us that if women feel that what they are being asked to do is against conscience, against common sense or against God, that they are not bound to submit. I suspect these submission verses that protect women and to prevent the kind of abuses of power that we see even today, where coercion plays a part. If we believe that man and woman are equal in the eyes of God and they have been given different strengths, then we move towards establishing God's perfect plan within marriage. Proverbs says a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. A woman can only build her home if she has control of or authority over herself. Otherwise, the things that control her will wield their influence in both her internal and external life. At the same time as taking back her power from those desires that rule her and beating them into submission and death, a woman also then needs to choose who she wants to be in the new world. And this is where she chooses to submit to Christ. And in choosing to marry, she also chooses to be under the authority of her husband. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. We are commanded to sacrifice daily both our own worldly wants and put God and others before us, including our wives and husbands. Husbands have an equal responsibility to treat wives with love as well as he treats himself. In order to create that lovely virtuous circle, which is what I think God intended from the start. The symbol of submission. Men must show reverence and submission as well as women. Women show reverence by covering their heads. Men show reverence by not covering their heads. Not that long ago, Christian women always covered their heads at church and many are now choosing to once again while well, lots of women are going to the root of the chapel veil, others are choosing things like hats, scarves or stylish headbands. Veils, three significant symbolic connotations of a veiled face are chastity, virtue and modesty, submission, obedience or commitment. A divinely recognised authority or power possessed by the veiled person demonstrated in teaching other women. These are all different veils, head coverings that have been used by different groups down the years. Interesting, Paul, uh, interestingly, Paul says men are to pray with their head uncovered, women to pray with their head covered. This is speaking of when we're praying out loud, men in the worship assembly, women at ladies' meetings, etc. Notice the Pope has his head covered. Ha. The sign of submission of a woman to the man was a cultural symbol in those lands where the veil was worn. Also seems to be custom in Paul's day because he mentions in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, when Paul is dealing with women praying and public speaking. In those days, men and women also wore their hair differently. 
It was expected that the woman wear long hair and the men short hair. Long hair was part of the woman's glory. The head covering was a sign of the woman recognizing God's authority when she prayed and spoke in public ladies' meetings. Headship means authority and responsibility. Long hair was also a sign by which the wife acknowledged the authority of her husband, who is her natural head. The veil is an additional covering which she was to wear when a woman took the lead role when women assembled together. In our Western culture, veils are no longer worn by wives as a symbol of submission to the husbands. But the teaching of the Bible that the wife is to be in submission to the husband as her head is still true. What God appoints is best, obedience to divine role concerning the sexes. If both respect one another and take the responsibilities seriously, it will result in blessing to both men and women. As the spirit of lawlessness increases, the word submission becomes more and more despised. Many associate the word submission with the thought of degradation. It is claimed that a woman is degraded by the position given to her by Paul. On this point, atheism makes a bid for the woman's patronage by seeking to prejudice her against Christianity. The following quotations are from atheists to reject God's divine authority order the sexes. <coughs> Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, I know of no other book that so fully teaches the subjection and degradation of women. Helen Gardner, women are indebted today for the emancipation from a position of hopeless degradation. Not to their religion or Jehovah, but to the justice and honour of the men who have defied his commands. That she doesn't crouch today where St Paul tried to bind her. She owes the men who are grand and brave enough to ignore St Paul and rise superior to his God. Women is given the place of submission not for her degradation but for her honour and pr protection. Her safety and happiness lie in her acceptance of that place. All Christians are commanded to be in submission to the civil authorities. Jesus was in submission to God the Father. Are they thereby degraded? Who but anarchist will say so? Ephesians 5, the church is said to be subject to Christ. Is the church, therefore, degraded? No, the relationship between husband and wife is illustrated by the relationship that exists between Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ gave himself for the church. Husbands should be prepared to give themselves for their wives. Love, respect, protection, care, financial support is owed by the husband to the wife. Is a woman degraded by willingly being a subjection to the man who loves her enough to die for her? Is a woman who has a promise to obey her husband to be pitied? No woman ought to marry a man whom she cannot promise to obey. It's about mutual respect and agape love, seeking one another's highest good. Sadly, in much of the world's men's attitudes towards women are despicable. In places like Belfast, Liverpool and Glasgow, it used to be said, Keep the woman barefoot, pregnant, and in the kitchen. In many parts of the world, it is the norm that girls as young as eight years of age are married off to men over 40 years of age. In Islam, men are encouraged to have as many as four wives, so as the first one gets older, she has to take a back seat to a younger model. Without God's guidance, many men's attitudes to women are similar to a dog seeing sausages left unattended on a table. He will grab them, use them, abuse them and move on to the next with no thought of the consequences. This attitude of men towards women is not the ideal that God strives to establish. God challenges men to look for the inward qualities in a woman rather than the outward attraction, to treat women with honour and respect. In the same way you wives must put yourselves under your husband's authority. Some of them may not obey the message, but through the lives of you wives these husbands will be won over without having say a word. They will see the kind of pure life you live which shows respect. Your beauty must not be the outer beauty of the fancy hairdos, wearing gold jewellery or expensive clothes. Rather let your adornment be the inner self with a lasting beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in God's sight. That kind of deep beauty was seen in the saintly woman of old who trusted God and fit it in with her husband's plans. 
in the home the place of authority is vested to the man by God. To talk of equal authority between man and wife is unrealistic, because someone always takes the lead. Equal authority is no authority. Things need to be discussed, but at some point someone must make the final decision. Where has God placed that final authority? With the husband or with the wife? God is challenging the man to step up and take responsibility. The Bible says that with the husband, the father is ultimately responsible for the conduct and spiritual welfare of his children. You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Bring them up in a nurture and admonition of the Lord. In his song of thanksgiving, after his life had been lengthened 15 years, Hezekiah said, The father to the children must make known the truth. The Lord said of Abraham, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. The responsibility of the husband and the father is the light of God's word. It's a tremendous result of manner. This is a responsibility that sadly many men have neglected to their cost, lost opportunities, lost relationships. Man's responsibility is a result of divinely ordained authority. In the congregation, men are to lead. What a need there is for men of our congregations to realize that the chief responsibility for the condition of the congregations rests upon them. They cannot accept. Uh, escape this responsibility. This idea of turning the work of the congregation over to women and children, as is so often done, is contrary to the word of God. It allows men to shirk their responsibilities. Let's make some ob observations. God never pr made provision for a woman to occupy the throne of Israel. Woman had no part in the priestly ministrations in the tabernacle or the temple. God never made a covenant with a woman. When the government of Israel had broken down, God described the conditions in a figurative way by saying, As for my people, children are the oppressors, and women rule over them. The same principle applies to women in the new dispensation as in the old. The apostles were men. Christ never called a single woman to be an apostle. When men were given the responsibility to sort things out at the Jewish congregation. In the assembly, God's organization, you see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, then the congregation with local elders over the local congregation. Elders are men. Here's the saying you can rely on. To want to be an elder, bishop or pastor, is to desire a noble task. That's why the elder, the bishop or pastor must have an impeccable character. Husband of one wife must be temperate, discreet, courteous, hospitable and a good teacher. That doesn't happen overnight. Not a heavy drinker, not a hot-tempered, but gentle and peaceable, not avaricious. A man who manages his own household well, brings up his children up to obey him and be well behaved. How can any man who does not understand how to manage his own household take care of the Church of God? He should not be a new convert, in case pride should turn his head, and he incur the same condemnation as the devil. It's also necessary to be held in good repute by outsiders, who never falls into dispute and a disrepute and into the devil's trap. Titus 3 says, The reason I left you behind in Crete was to organize everything that still had to be done and appoint elders, bishops and pastors in every town in the way I told you. Each one of them must be a man of irreproachable character, husband of one wife. His children must be believers, not liable to be charged with disorderly conduct or insubordination. The elder, bishop or pastor, has to be irreproachable since he is God's representative, never arrogant or hot-tempered, not a heavy drinker, not violent, not avaricious. Hospitable, lover of goodness, sensible, upright, devout, self-controlled. Firm grasped on the unchanging message of the tradition, so he can be counted on for both giving encouragement and sound doctrine and for refuting those who argue against it. Even deacons. Similarly, deacons must be respectable, not double-tongued, moderate in the amount of wine they drink, and with no squalid agreed for money. They must hold to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. They are first to be examined and admitted to serve as deacons only if there is nothing against them. Similarly, women must be respectable, not gossips, but sober and wholly reliable. 
Deacons must be the husband of one wife. There must be people who manage their children and households well. Those of them who carry out their duties well as deacons will earn a high standing for themselves and an authoritative voice in matters concerning faith in Christ. Evangelists recorded in scripture are men. Peter, Paul, Stephen, Philip. Women are equal to men where their salvation is concerned. Neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, all one in Christ Jesus. Yet women are not to teach over men in mixed assemblies. It's not because we don't like women. We think women can't do as well as men. We think women are inferior. We think women don't know the Bible. We want to hold to old traditions. Timothy says, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first and Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. In mixed assemblies, roles of men and women, men are to pray everywhere, women are to be under subjection. There's no mention of a woman speaking at the Lord's Supper where men and women were commanded to assemble together. There's no mention of a woman praying where men are present. There were, no oppor there were opportunities for women to speak. Philip had four prophesying daughters. So we're not talking about women teaching women or women teaching children. We're talking about women publicly preaching to mixed men and women audiences. <clears throat> Again, First Timothy 2, I don't let women teach men or have authority over them. Let them listen quietly to the assembly. Biblical restrictions, not to teach over a man, not to have authority. This will be dealing with men in the congregation. Uh, there's no, no reason why they couldn't teach uh, non-Christian men because they need to be brought to salvation. It's the order of creation. It's a transgression of sin. Reasons for the restrictions, why? Because God made Adam first and afterwards he made Eve. It was not for Adam, it was not Adam who was fooled, but it was Satan, by Satan, by, but Eve. Sin was the result. So the order of creation and the transgression of sin. These are the only reasons found in the Bible for the submission of woman to the man. <clears throat> to talk about local conditions of Corinth or anywhere else as a ground of command for a woman to give silence to the congregation is to add to the word of God. It is a case wishful thinking of the wish being the father to the throat. Women are not to address the assembly. Let your woman keep silent in the congregations. If they want to learn something, let them ask at home. It's shameful to women to speak in an assembly. The context, worship assembly, the Lord's Supper. Therefore, the whole assembly comes together in one place and all speak with tongues and I commend those who are uninformed or unbelievers will not say you out of your mind. Silence, submission, not over a man. Silent, not addressing the assembly. Yet commanded to sing. Silence means not taking a leading role. The problem with misuse of gifts at Cor Corinth seems to have been created some bad feeling and bad practices between Christians. Paul writes to give some correction to both attitudes and practices. Because God had given women also some of the gifts described in 1 Corinthians in the first century to help to reach other women in the, in the gospel, some women had no doubt abused that privilege when trying to use their gifts in the worship assembly, thereby creating a greater problem. To which Paul responds and gives clear instructions of how things ought to be done. Why we do not have women, women preachers? God placed man, not woman, in leadership. Women are not to teach over man. Women are not to address the assembly. Despite the number of women that were described in the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, is it not strange that women are thus invariably omitted if they were meant to do such work and act in the same role as men? In Timothy and Titus, where Paul describes how each congregation is governed, Paul lays down quite specific instructions on the roles of men and women. It's like a woman described in the scriptures taking on the same role as men is also quite specific and can only be understood in the basis of a woman's role being different from that of a man. If Christ calls women to a public ministry, how do you account for his waiting nearly 2,000 years before doing so? Until recent times, no woman claimed such a call. In all Protestant Catholic churches until recently, women were not permitted to serve as elders, deacons or preachers. 
the practice of women speaking to a mixed assemblies in any congregation is a modern innovation that will, in time, corrupt the congregation. Why? Because the authority of the Word of God will have been set aside to accommodate people's wishes and demands. In Protestant Catholic churches, we find historically that women fast were invited to pray in mixed assemblies. Then women were invited to read a passage of scripture. Then women were invited to help serve at the communion table. Then women were given special lay person duties. Then women were given special deacons positions. Then women were encouraged to become vicars or preachers. Then, in the Church of Scotland, women have been promoted to the position of elder of the kirk. Despite the biblical qualifications for an elder, is described as being the husband of one wife, a qualification they could never have. Much skill is being used today in an effort to set aside the plain teaching of the Bible. Those who are conscious upon the question are often ridiculed and browbeaten. They are called women haters and uncooperative because they will not support that which is obviously opposed to the word of God. The commands of the Bible may be classed as moral and positive. A moral command is a command for which a moral reason can be seen, such as, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. A positive command is a command to which no moral reason is apparent. It lies in the sovereign pleasure of God. God's command to Moses to speak the rock rather than to strike it is a positive command. Uzziah was struck down for disobedience. The prohibition against touching the ark for which Uzziah lost his life is a positive command. <clears throat> the command to repent and be immersed is a positive command. The command for women to keep silent in the congregation is a positive command command. The only reason that can be given for obedience to positive commands is that God has given them. The greatest test of spirituality is not obedience to moral commands, for the unregenerate may keep them, but the God-given positive commands is to walk by faith. I'd like to appeal on behalf of the sisters, where we men often fail to do them justice and that a lack of suitable arrangements for them to deprive the congregations of a potent agency for good. In some instances, we might arrange for sisters' meetings, where they might pray, read the scripture, and speak and encourage one another. In other instances, we might only require to make it possible that the sisters make their own arrangements for their meetings. In addition to sisters teaching sisters, might there not be women's outreach meetings, meetings conducted solely by women, with only women present, would be on New Testament lines. Systematic visitation of women by women, both within the congregation, membership, and beyond it, is equally desirable. And widows indeed could be employed as such in, in such useful service as visiting and conducting women's meetings. A value of such service would be incalculable. Women would then find openings for every desirable aspiration to serve their Lord. Work could be undertaken that men cannot do, and the extreme of putting Pushing some women into the role of men would also be avoided. While we may take an unflinching stand against women being made men, let us correspondingly, correspondingly, correspondingly thoughtful and watchful to employ women in every aspect of service sanctioned by the scripture. To help them with a known sphere, be co-laborers in the gospel, co-servants in the Lord's work. Women have tremendous talents and abilities to use in the service of the Lord in every congregation. Paul challenges us all in Romans 12. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasable to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do be conformed to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and prove what your God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The divine rule of the sexes is a positive command given by God, continued in the New Testament. The concept and teaching is carried over into the Christian church, as is evident by the clear and unambig un unambiguous teaching of the apostles as referred to in this study. Both men and women will be happier and more effective in teaching others and raising their families if they respect God's divine role for the sexes. We are members of his body. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery when I'm talking about Christ and the Church. God challenges us to use all our talents and abilities to help others see Jesus, 
to gossip the gospel to others. May we look for ways to serve God better through a quiet word, through holy lives, may we reflect the beauty of Jesus, and by his grace help others to know his salvation. Psalm 119 says, Teach me, Holy One, the way of your statutes. I will observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your teaching and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Turn my heart to your decrees and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities. Give me life in your ways. Confirm your servant, your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the disgrace that I dread, for your ordinances are good. See, I have longed for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. A poem. When Christ was sacrificed, the Roman spear went deep. In his death, at his last breath, he went into death's sleep. From his side came Jesus' bride with water and the blood. We are she in purity, cleansed by that holy flood. From the dead arose our head to rule on heaven's throne. Now we pray that some day he'll come back for his own. One of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. There are three that testify, the spirit, the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. The church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing of water through the word. I hope you find this lessons helpful uh, and I've tried to at least highlight some of the problems and to look at some ways of looking at the overall scriptural answers to those problems and uh, please continue to study the question and if you find any good answers uh, please feel free to let me know. Thank you very much. God bless.